<laughs> thanks. Yeah, so thanks to all you guys who made it today because <laughs> it's cold out, you know. It looks like our numbers are a bit low. Um, but I'm really glad that you guys uh, were all able to be here today because I would consider this uh, the most important class um, of the course. Um, something that really, is, as, as Bob said, really hits close to home. Um, so first off, let me just ask, uh, who here has heard of Cahokia? Has anyone not heard of Cahokia? <laughs> Looks like quite a few. Okay. So I suspected that might be the case. Well, I have news for you. Uh, Cahokia was an ancient civilization just around the corner, uh, and people that were part of Cahokia literally lived, I don't know, probably under this building, uh, or on the ground here, in Middle Tennessee at any rate. So probably in, in your, literally in your backyards. Uh, so I think it's very important uh, that we uh, get to know uh, the Cahokians and uh, Native American civilizations, uh, literally from Middle Tennessee, too. Uh, to me, this really is a, a bit shocking uh, that uh, the lack of awareness of uh, Cahokia civilization um, and of Native American civilization in this area. Um, so, I, you know, I grew up here in Middle Tennessee in Nashville, um, and being a very dorky, archaeologically inclined kid, I didn't even have any idea about this. I was reading about ancient Egypt. Um, so I think that just attests to a, a general lack of education about the Native American past uh, in, in, in the United States here. Um, so I think that serves as a case in point. Okay, so, uh, so uh, what we're going to be talking about here is pretty much everything east of the Mississippi River. So uh, I would love to have time to get into the Puebloan civilizations, the Anasazi of the southwest. Um, probably many of you have visited Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon, uh, but sadly that'll have to be for another class. We just don't have time for that. So we're going to look east of the Mississippi to some of these um, perhaps less famous uh, and less known uh, civilizations. So what characterized Cahokia uh, and many societies that actually came before it uh, was, above all else, uh, the, the idea of the mound, the mound site, the mound on the plaza. And uh, this map is just gives you an idea of some of the, pr uh, probably not even all, but um, the sites uh, across the eastern U U.S. where you can see mount, Native American mounds. Uh, so Cahokia came out of a long tradition of mound building in this part of America uh, for thousands and thousands of years, actually. So these mounds are, you know, uh, pyramid-shaped uh, agglomerations of, of earth, uh, and to the casual eye, they might just look like a natural formation. Uh, and for a long time, when uh, European Americans in the U.S. saw these, they, they assumed that they were just naturally created. Um, once people started building on them or farming on top of them, they came to realize that these were most definitely made by human beings. So kind of the first myth that, they'd, um, that got demolished was the idea that these were just natural formations. So, uh, you know, when we've talked about the adobe pyramids of South America and the stone pyramids of the Maya, uh, an earthen pyramid may initially sound not quite as impressive as these other things. Uh, but in fact, mounds required a lot of work and a lot of engineering. So these were really uh, very important accomplishments that we should recognize as such. Um, for one thing, um, when archaeologists have excavated into some of these mounds, like the uh, Monk's Mound at Cahokia that we'll talk about later, um, they found evidence that people were working with different kinds of soil uh, to make sure that the mounds would stay solid and um, endure over a long period of time. Uh, for instance, they altered layers of more and less permeable soils like clay uh, in order to facilitate runoff and make sure that the mound wouldn't erode. Also, mounds were just extremely large and required uh, the movement of a lot of dirt. Uh, so in, in many cases, uh, millions of cubic feet of dirt. I don't know if any of you have ever spent time just digging a big hole in the ground with a shovel. You know, I have in my line of work. Uh, it takes a long time, longer than you'd really expect. So you, uh, think about Native Americans at this time. They didn't even have shovels. They were using hoes and then carting the dirt around in baskets on their back. So this was really, truly an impressive feat. Uh, and one archaeologist has characterized mound building uh, peoples as the da Vinci's of dirt, in a way. So uh, mounds have long been recognized by European Americans uh, or by non-Native Americans in the United States, uh, really from the earliest times that uh, Europeans started coming here and recording history. 
So one of our founding fathers actually gets wrapped up in this. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is sometimes recognized as one of the fathers of archaeology, too, because he had uh, one of these mounds on uh, some of his property in Virginia, and, and he decided to carry out a kind of proto-scientific excavation, uh, and he realized that as you go down the layers of the mound, or just of, of, of Earth in general, you get, you know, you reach older levels. Uh, so in other words, he identified the principle of stratigraphy, and uh, this is illustrated here in this early colonial drawing. Um, of the layers inside of an earthen mound. Um, and then throughout the 1800s, you get explorers uh, and you know, naturalists who go around and um, start mapping and start recording some of these mounds, trying to figure out what was going on here. So at this time period, um, most people uh, adhered to what is now known as the mound builder myth. The mound builder myth. Uh, so when Europeans came to uh, North America, they saw these very impressive constructions, and they thought, um, Surely these, you know, wild Indians that we're dealing with, that we're, you know, trading beads to, they're covered in feathers and paint and live in the forest, surely these people could not have built these mounds. Uh, so they looked elsewhere to this mythical race of the mound builders. They didn't know who they were, but they thought, um, you know, they might have been people from Atlantis or the lost tribes of Israel or lost Welsh travelers, um, various theories like that. Yeah, so, you know, you'd think the logical thing would just be to look at the people that are in place there today, but they didn't do that. Um, and, you know, this kind of thing still, we, we laugh, but it's a little bit pervasive, too, because we look to the History Channel and the Discovery Channel, and over and over again we see this idea that, you know, these peoples couldn't possibly have built these accomplishments, um, when really the easiest solution is just to say, yeah, well, something must have changed, and they definitely did. So that's the myth of the mound builders. Um, and for a long time, it was very pernicious in, um, in divorcing uh, modern Native Americans from their past, from recognizing that, they, uh, that their progenitors were the ones who had accomplished uh, these, these constructions. OK, so Cahokia. We're going to get back to Cahokia. And that's about uh, 1,000 AD. But let's go thousands of thousands of years before that and um, kind of trace where these mounds come from in eastern North America. So Watson Break is, uh, as far as we know, uh, the earliest site uh, with monumental mound architecture. Uh, it actually dates to 3,500 BC, so right about the time that the pyramids in Egypt were taking off. And Watson Break is actually the earliest monumental architecture in the entire New World, so earlier than Mesoamerica, earlier than the Andes. Um, instead, what, where we see it is in northeastern Louisiana here. Uh, Watson Brake uh, is owned on private property, and the, the landowners only brought it to the attention of archaeologists in the 1980s, so our knowledge of it is relatively recent. Uh, and when it came to light, it surprised a lot of people because they saw that it was built by um, people who are hunters and gatherers. They're, they weren't even settled and farming at this point. Uh, so this Mm, throw a major wrench in a lot of archaeological theories because people had long assumed that civilization depended on p farmers producing extra crops in order to support um, the people that were laboring in this. Uh, and what they saw instead was that uh, people with a very um, technologically simplistic um, way of life uh, were in fact able to accomplish these things. Uh, so, so finds like this have um, caused archaeologists to rethink some of their theories about world history. So that's Watson Break. Um, still another very early site, but better known, uh, is the site of Poverty Point, which is also located in northeastern Louisiana. Uh, this dates uh, to as early as 1700 BC. So we're still talking very early. We're still talking earlier than the Maya at this point here. Poverty Point is one of three World Heritage Sites uh, built by Native Americans here in the U.S., uh, the others being Chaco Canyon and Cahokia itself. Um, it was actually just designated a World Heritage Site last year, so I encourage you to go visit these World Heritage Sites that belong to our country. Uh, Poverty Point consists of nine semi-circular uh, rings of earth. Uh, they were large enough that buildings might have been built on them, but were still unclear as to whether people lived on these or not. Uh, they front uh, a bayou here, and then on the opposite side was a pyramid. Uh, it's very eroded now, but it was probably in the shape of a bird originally. Uh, so Poverty Point was this monumental ceremonial center, uh, 
And we're not sure if people lived here or not uh, on a permanent basis or if people just came here for, for pilgrimages, pilgrimages, essentially. Uh, but we do know that people came from all over the United States, um, throughout the Mississippi Valley and the Southeast. Uh, they came, you know, and we're thinking like hunter-gatherer hunter people. So, so, you know, still a very simple period uh, early in North American history. Um, but people brought these materials uh, that uh, archaeologists have traced to far-flung far parts of the U.S., uh, many of them are these beautiful stone objects and uh, what I would call the cutest artifacts that we're going to study in this class. Um, these little owls, I think they're very nice. Uh, there were many other kinds of mounds, too, uh, in the upper Midwest. Uh, like in the Wisconsin area, there were... Um, uh, a number of effigy mounds, which are much smaller, uh, often only a few feet high, but these are mounded earth in the shape of animals, uh, things like bears, birds, uh, serpents, and so on. Some of them are a little bit hard to see, you know, like that one here. Um, but, uh, w and this results from the fact that like all mounds uh, in, in, in North America, uh, they're not as... Um, enduring as stone architecture, as adobe architecture that we saw um, the previous weeks. Um, they're more uh, fragile, and uh, most of them have been used um, in, as farmland uh, by, you know, Euro-Americans or other Americans in um, recent centuries. So they've often suffered a lot of damage, and many of them would originally have stood a lot higher. Uh, perhaps the best-known effigy mound is this one called Serpent Mound, which is in Ohio. Beautiful, right? Uh, it uh, was about 1,300 feet long, uh, even though it was only several feet high. Uh, this one hasn't had any artifacts found inside. It was just simply mounded earth to create this form. Uh, so we don't actually know what time period this dates to. It might have been before Cahokia, or it may have been later. And then it, kind of the immediate predecessor culture to Cahokia was known as the Hopewell. Uh, the Hopewell lived um, between 200 BC to 400 AD, and they were really centered um, kind of in the Ohio area, uh, in the eastern part of North America, too. Uh, what the Hopewell describes, this term Hopewell doesn't really refer to a particular civilization or a particular culture. Uh, it describes a whole very expansive range of interacting local groups. Uh, they shared some cultural features, uh, but they are all locally, locally organized uh, and, and also different in many ways. The Hopewell uh, were characterized uh, by their uh, dense... Um, uh, by their intense trading networks, by their interactions. Uh, so they were bringing things like grizzly bear teeth from um, the Rocky Mountains, shark teeth from the, um, from the Gulf Coast, freshwater pearls from various places, copper from Michigan, um, mica from the Appalachians. Uh, so you see these really far-flung networks of people that are interacting. Uh, and using all of these... Um, raw materials, they were able to produce um, incredible works of art, uh, such as this, I mean, I think this is truly just a masterpiece, uh, a human hand, this is carved out of a sheet of mica, so we're talking like two millimeters thick, basically like the thickness of paper, so it's just beautifully translucent here. And they too were mound building cultures. Uh, the Hopewell mounds uh, were located in, in sites uh, that had a few clusters of mounds and plazas. Um, these were burial mounds or also mounds with um, buildings on top for important ceremonies. Uh, but these were not urban sites. These were ceremonial centers, uh, and people lived in far-flung areas and came together occasionally to the sites um, to carry out important uh, communal ceremonies. Uh, and during the same early time period before Cahokia, um, we see this one site, I mention it this because it's in western Tennessee, Pinson Mounds, so you might want to um, pop on over there and check it out one of these days. Um, so Pinson Mounds, date, Pinson Mounds uh, date relatively to this uh, same time period, 200 BC to AD 1400. Uh, it's a collection of, uh, I think, about eight mounds. Some of them are pretty large. Like other Hopewell sites, it was not home to a large residential population, but again, it was more of a ceremonial site. Um, it's located in um, Jackson, Tennessee, so between here and Memphis. I think it's about two hours west of here, so it's got a little museum. 
It's worth, it's worth a trip. Uh, and a number of artifacts. There's been a, some excavation here, too. Uh, one of the artifacts uh, found here that stands out are these uh, carvings made of bone. These are actually made of part of a skull, a human skull. Um, I'm not saying these were sacrificed people, but it was from someone at some point. Um, so it's a little hard to see the carvings, but you can see them there. So yeah, so that's pins and mounds. Okay, so eventually, uh, after this long tradition of mound building, we get to Cahokia itself. And we can very precisely pinpoint the time of its, ri of its mm, rising, uh, which was around 1050 AD. So, you know, during the height of the Middle Ages, in, or the early Middle Ages in Europe, uh, was when Cahokia first came about. So Cahokia is located basically in St. Louis nowadays. Uh, it's in this area of floodplain, um, which, you know, floodplains were traditionally known as bottom areas. So this area is actually called the American Bottom for this bigger area. And it's where the Missouri River and the Mississippi River come together. So already you can see, uh, based on its geography, that it was very centrally located, uh, and uh, people living here would have had access um, you know, to all the areas along the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers, you know, two of the major river systems in, in America. Uh, and it was a very fertile area, so it was really just a prime location for a civilization to flourish. So you can see right here in this bend between Illinois and Missouri. So, uh, uh, one of you guys uh, last week very astutely asked, um, well, why haven't we been studying uh, the rise of civilizations more? We've been focused on their collapse. So I want to engage that question a bit. <laughs> uh, okay, I didn't think that was funny, but that's fine. Right. <laughs> Um, so, so where did Cahokia come from? You know, so it, it came from this longer tradition, but what are some of the more proximate factors that brought about its rise? Uh, so it's, it's a complex question, uh, and uh, there are a lot of different things to think about here. Um, for one thing, there, are, there had been, uh, well, uh, in this location had been a small village of about a thousand people, so kind of moderate-sized village for that time. Uh, but it certainly wasn't unique. There were different villages like this all over North America at this point, like Pinson Mounds. Uh, so what made Cahokia so big? Because it truly was the biggest by far um, in its day. So uh, some, many archaeologists traditionally would argue that it just kind of evolved. You know, um, uh, maize became a big staple crop at this time. Uh, so people assume that with you know, the growth of more maize, the city um, would have had you know, extra surplus to support artisans and elites. Uh, but this doesn't really pan out because this would have been going on throughout the eastern US at this time, too. Uh, so, you know, other sites presumably would also have gotten very large. Uh, so we have to look to more specific factors um, that uh, took place in Cahokia itself that, that were localized uh, and um, uh, things that might be a little bit difficult to get at archaeologically. Uh, one line of thinking that many people have proposed uh, is that Cahokia's rise was associated with the development of a new uh, religious system, of a new cult, essentially, um, that led to a new way of life, uh, the creation of a new, new place and a new city. This uh, wouldn't be the first time in world history that uh, the creation of a new religion was associated with the creation of a new place for that um, for its uh, adherence, uh, you know, we could think uh, just in the U.S. of Salt Lake City was essentially a product of the creation of Mormon religion and the um, pilgrimage led by Brigham Young out there. Um, so that is one, one way of thinking, and much of the religious iconography is specific to Cahokia, so this um, probably played a very important role. We could also think of uh, just a very charismatic or politically compelling leader attracted a lot of follower, followers and was able to organize the system. This would be a very difficult thing to get at archaeologically, so it's hard to tell. Uh, and then one other factor involved here might have been a supernova that um, astronomers have uh, been able to determine took place uh, around, or specifically in 1054 AD. So if you think that changes were already kind of afoot uh, in, among these people at this time, changes in religion, changes in political organization, uh, and then suddenly this crazy new thing appears in the skies, this could have been kind of an omen or seen as, you know, um, perhaps a sign of things going right um, or a sign that things needed to change or were changing. It could have been very powerful to people that, you know, habitually were looking at the skies, that, that understood the stars, 
you know, now we live in an era where um, there's so much light pollution that you can hardly see the sky, but for people who are very familiar with this on a daily basis, it would have been a very powerful um, sign. So there are many factors involved uh, in Cahokia, in Cahokia's rise. Um, so to give uh, an, uh, just a little bit of an idea of what Cahokia was for people that aren't familiar with it, uh, it was a huge city. Uh, so when we talked about um, Tenochtitlan being a very big urban center, this was the same thing with Cahokia. Uh, it was home to as many as 20,000 people. Uh, and uh, just to put that in perspective, uh, there was no city this big in the United States until the late 18th century, so like the era of the Founding Fathers. It took that long for um, another city of comparable size to come about in the U.S. Um, Cahokia uh, was much, much, much larger than any of the other mound centers at this time period. Um, it had 120 of these platform mounds, you know, like here and here and here and here. Um, so 120 different ones. And altogether, this involved um, the movement of 35 million cubic feet of earth. So we're talking uh, a lot of manpower to get this thing built. Uh, so unlike all of the... Uh, mound-centered uh, ceremonial sites that had come before Cahokia. Uh, Cahokia was a place where people lived. It wasn't just a, people, uh, a place where people came to it occasionally to participate in communal ceremonies, um, but it was uh, the center of a new way of life uh, and the home to many, ooh, I'm sorry, to many different uh, inhabitants here. So the rise of Cahokia entailed uh, massive changes in the countryside surrounding it and the whole population in this American bottom area uh, in Missouri and Illinois was reorganized in order to support this city. Uh, so we know, uh, based on the distribution of sites around here, uh, that uh, agriculture was completely reorganized, uh, so that uh, farmers, uh, as far as 30 miles out, were um, specializing in maize production that went to support the city itself. And there seems to have been some inequality here, too. Um, these people uh, had more of a maize-based diet uh, with less protein, uh, so overall not as healthy um, because they're dedicating their time to supporting the people in the city center. Uh, the rise of Cahokia also uh, entailed uh, a massive um, growth in population. So the original town of Cahokia had had about 10, no, sorry, 1,000 inhabitants, uh, with in a span of probably 50 years it had 20,000 people. So we're talking about um, major influx of residents here. This would have been far more than could have been achieved through natural growth. Uh, so again, we kind of see the fact that this wasn't just an evolutionary change where a city gradually got bigger. Um, there, were, there were big changes and people were coming to the city, obviously for a very particular reason. Uh, the city was organized into different neighborhoods. Um, these were kind of community-based or might have been very large kin groups. Uh, it's likely that they represented whole communities that were, co were coming in from other areas and immigrating here. Uh, and they probably would have had very different, or we know that they had different cultural practices because this is reflected uh, in the artifacts that they made at home, uh, in their, like in their pottery and the way that they chipped stones and so on. So the upshot of this is that Cahokia was a very diverse place. You know, there were lots of people, lots of ideas, and um, you know, cultural melding coming from different areas. Um, so it was, it, was di it was diverse, and it was, it was bustling here, too. Okay, so to give you a little bit of the layout here, uh, this is this kind of the, the downtown of Cahokia. Uh, at the center was this enormous mound, Monk's Mound, and then there was this massive plaza in front. Uh, late, late in, uh, the, the, in Cahokia's period, uh, this palisade, this protective wall was built around the site here, too. Uh, and then over here is another feature I'll get to called Woodhenge. Okay, so we'll come back to this. Another factor in Cahokia's rise was a, sport, uh, a, a game, a sports game, uh, called Chunky. Has anyone heard of Chunky? Very few. Okay. Well, ch Chunky uh, was so important that it might, uh, some archaeologists uh, hypothesized that it might have been uh, one of the fundamental aspects that led to Cahokia uh, gaining preeminence over all these different mound centers. Uh, because Chunky was really exciting, it was really compelling, and we know that people uh, really got into this game uh, in a way comparable to modern uh, you know, sports teams, uh, probably even more so. So when Euro European, tra uh, Euro-American travelers started um, um, 
exploring the interior of North America in the 1700s, the 1800s, uh, they found Native American groups all over the southeast and the Mississippi Valley that were still playing this game. Um, and we know that it all came from Cahokia because uh, they all shared the same name for it. So it wasn't like it developed independently. It all came from this source. And Cahokia actually has um, uh, evidence for the earliest playing of this game. So what Chunky is, uh, is um, there, there are two teams, and the players would roll these stones. These stones are probably about this big or so. They're like a really large hockey, hockey puck, and they're kind of depressed on one side. So they would roll these stones in a specially prepared plaza, and then the players from each team would throw these very long spears, uh, and we're not sure they would either try to actually hit the stones and make them stop, uh, or throw the spears at a point in the ground where they were predicting that uh, the stones would land. So essentially what this was was a gambling game, and it led to big time gambling, uh, uh, more intense even than you know people now that have a gambling problem, um, because when the explorers were, were recording the, the, the later Native Americans playing this game, they would note that people got so into it and they gambled away um, all the clothes off their back and they didn't even stop there. They, um, uh, there's at least one story where someone gambled away his wife. Uh, <laughs> And then it even got so bad that some people would go into servitude, essentially become slaves uh, to the winner of the Chunky game. So it was very addicting. It was compelling and intense. And at Cahokia, we might imagine that, um, you know, if different uh, town centers, you know, are bringing teams together, you know, like, uh, like the Titans and, you know, whoever else, um, you'd get that same kind of, of rivalry and of competition. So it's a very, probably a very loaded, politically significant game, and it'd be, in addition to just being very exciting. Uh, so the whole grand plaza here... Um, would actually have been used for the Chunky game. So it's really at the heart of city life here, too. So it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just entertainment people did on the side. It was very, very important. Okay, so, to, you know, continuing the tour of Cahokia, Monk's Mound is the biggest mound uh, at Cahokia, and it's this one right here at the end of the plaza. Uh, Monk's Mound, uh, depending on how you count it, uh, was either one of the biggest or the biggest uh, monumental construction in the New World. It stood about 100 feet high, and uh, its volume was uh, roughly comparable to the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. So it's very, very large. Uh, its construction began uh, with the very foundation of the site around 1050, and it was actually built um, kind of as part and parcel of this bigger uh, construction project that involved the central plaza, too. So we kind of think of a plaza as just, oh, you know, the flat open area here covered in grass or dirt or whatever. Uh, but once archaeologists uh, excavated in the plaza, they realized that it, too, was part of this uh, major project. Because uh, naturally it had been kind of, you know, ripply ground, uh, but Cahokians brought in dirt uh, to fill in the low-lying low areas, and then they leveled out the rest of it to create a very nice surface. And it was actually engineered so expertly that there's a slight slope to it and water drains off, so, so rainwater doesn't pool here. So it would have stayed uh, open and adequate for different kinds of ceremonies or chunky games or whatnot. So it's all part and parcel of the same thing. Uh, and this, this area is so massive, the central downtown, uh, that it takes 20 minutes just to walk across uh, this, the Great Plaza. So we're talking very big scale here. Uh, the reason it's called Monk's Mound, if any of you guys are wondering, is because um, during the early 19th century, when St. Louis was just kind of coming about, there was a community of Trappist monks living on top of Monk's Mound. Um, so I like to imagine them brewing delicious Belgian beer, but I don't, <laughs> I don't think that was the case. Uh, another um, notable feature of Cahokia was what has been called Woodhenge, and it was located farther west of the town center. Uh, Woodhenge was probably an astronomical observatory, similar to Stonehenge, obviously, in England. Uh, it was a circle made up of uh, upright red cedar posts. Um, it got built uh, numerous times over Cahokia's uh, history, so the size and the number of posts changed. Uh, but at the largest point, it contained 60 posts made of red cedar. Uh, this was a sacred uh, type of wood to later Native Americans, so this was an important place. 
uh, at Cahokia. Uh, but the, the architectural changes at Cahokia went, uh, uh, occurred not just at the top of society, but all the way down to the most basic kinds of architecture, uh, in other words, houses. So the changes wrought uh, in people's way of life at Cahokia really just penetrated all aspects of society. So even um, you know, how people went about uh, making their dwellings changed. Uh, and this was a very characteristic aspect uh, of people that were part of Cahokia culture. So archaeologists working in many different sites can recognize people's um, sort of connection or loyalty to the site of Cahokia by looking at uh, how they changed their house building practices. What this boiled down to was the traditional way to build houses at this point uh, was to go around and put upright posts in the ground and then to kind of weave them together with um, branches and cover it in wattle and daub. <coughs> when Cahokia came along, uh, this changed uh, so that people would build a trench in the ground first, and then alongside the trench they would line up all of their um, posts that they were going to use on the ground, tie them all together in this big kind of plank, and then they would um, put, set it upright in the middle of the trench and fill it in. Uh, so this sounds mm, uh, maybe not that significant, but what it meant was that uh, people could build houses a lot faster um, and then make them fit this kind of shared template. Uh, and it also changed the way people worked, you know, rather than just a family of you know, several people building, um, their, you know, making their house uh, kind of on a low-key scale, and this allowed kind of mass production, and it enabled the, the creation of this huge urban environment of Cahokia within a very short time span. So what we get all of this uh, is that to, to people living in eastern North America uh, who had, you know, through all of history up to that point, been living in small villages and small communities, uh, suddenly there was this new place uh, there was really a whole urban experience, uh, unlike anything that they had um, been part of before. You know, you could walk into this uh, city where everything around you was built by human beings, you know, just the whole environment. So this, you know, probably created a, a new sensibility of the world and of people's place in it, too. Uh, like I mentioned before, it was also a very diverse place where you'd encounter people with different beliefs and different practices who, who look differently, who talk differently, or dress differently. Uh, so it was really just a very unique, uh, very different thing. Uh, when we talk about Mesoamerica with, with Tenochtitlan being a very exciting city in a similar way, that was very different because uh, Mesoamerica had a long tradition of urbanism. People had always lived in cities. Uh, so Cahokia probably had a you know, real major impact uh, that was you know, even more intense than what had been seen in Mexico before. You know, I don't know specifically, but presumably, yeah. I'm, you know, on a day like this, I'm sure they were not wearing um, <laughs> stuff just down there. Yeah. It, uh, but in, in all honesty, man, it's, um, you know, dress can be a very hard thing to reconstruct archaeologically because, um, you know, leather and materials like, like uh, cotton don't preserve well. So don't, don't know 100% for sure. Okay, so part of this whole phenomenon uh, was... Uh, social inequality uh, and the rise of leaders who were of a scale uh, unlike anything before them in North America. And uh, even when European travelers got to North America, they encountered very powerful chiefs uh, in charge of whole political groups. Uh, so even then, uh, you know, like, like this engraving down here, I think this is from a of a chief in Florida. Um, <clears throat> so even then, there was still continuing this legacy of, of power of uh, social inequalities. Uh, so what was going on at the top of the pyramids where there were these ceremonies taking place? Uh, well, we know uh, that there were probably some kind of royalty, we might call it, at Cahokia. <coughs> and uh, uh, much of what we know comes from uh, one particular uh, uh, part of, of Cahokia called Mound 72. So it's kind of unassuming looking, just you know, barely looks like a rise in the earth here. Um, but archaeologists, uh, and I think they're working in the 50s or 60s, uh, realized, let me go back to the map here. So they looked at the site map of Cahokia, and actually everything on the whole site is aligned uh, according to the same orientation of the cardinal directions. So everything was made on this particular layout, except for this little guy here, which kind of sits at an, off, at an offset angle. It was actually oriented to uh, a particular astronomical alignment. I want to say the spring equinox, um, but I might be wrong on that. Um, 
so they were, you know, they kind of pinpointed something was up with this, and they, they thought they would take a look. So what they found inside Mound 72 really shocked them. Uh, in short, it was home to hundreds of human burials, I think uh, 109, no, 270 people in total in this small mound. The focal point of these burials uh, were two men that were buried on top of each other, you know, laid out in a very ceremonious way. Um, way. Uh, so they were literally stacked right on top of each other, and in the middle of them uh, was a beaded cloak in the shape of a falcon. So you can kind of make it out here. It's not the best photo. But that's what we're looking at. So when the archaeologists ran into this, it immediately uh, caught, their, caught their attention um, because uh, falcons, uh, thunderbirds in general, uh, were uh, a central um, uh, element in many later Native American mythologies. And even more specifically, uh, the other characteristics of the burial linked these two men to two characters uh, that were very important in um, Ho-Chunk and, and Iowa mythology uh, of the historical period. Uh, specifically, these were twin brothers uh, who carried out many heroic exploits involving chunky games, involving battles, and these men here were also buried with <coughs> a huge... Um, cache of chunky stones uh, and with a very large number of bundled arrows too, arrowheads. Uh, so they made this connection and they, they thought that perhaps um, these were elites, uh, leaders even, and uh, perhaps their authority rested on this association with these powerful ancestral figures. So I'm going I'm to ask you guys to think way back to last week when I, t when I talked about the Señor de Cipan and the Moche culture uh, and how the burial of the Señor de Cipan um, when archaeologists found it, they realized that he was kind of an incarnation of this powerful Moche deity, uh, so that his leader rested on that association. <clears throat> so probably the same thing was going on with Mound 72. And these, myth these you know, later mythologies were actually uh, foundational to elite power in Cahokia. So along with these guys were you know, the other 268 people found in Mound 72. And these people uh, met uh, a less respected death. These, were ritual, pe these people were all ritually sacrificed in a variety of different ways. So there were a number of incidents where um, mass groups of people were killed and buried in Mound 72 along with these two leaders. Um, you see the skeletons here that were decapitated. Um, one of the most remarkable incidents here was um, uh, there were 52 young women who were um, between the ages of 15 and 25, and they were buried with one older woman. Uh, so they were all sacrificed and buried together, uh, and actually archaeologists uh, who have studied their, their bones uh, have um, learned that they ate uh, a somewhat impoverished diet, you know, uh, low in protein. Uh, they've also determined that they came from outside the immediate Cahokia area. Um, so, you know, we might think of Cahokians, you know, uh, taking young women from these uh, farming populations out in their hinterland and bringing them to, uh, to the town to be sacrificed in, the, in this ceremony honoring the two leaders. Later on, there was a group of 39 men and women, uh, and um, they've been able to kind of reconstruct the event in which they were sacrificed. The large pit was opened up, and these men and women were all lined up along the pit and then actually clubbed in the head, um, bludgeoned, and then fell into the pit where they died. So that's what you're seeing over here, I guess. Uh, so you know, this, is, uh, this is a little bit different from the role of human sacrifice we've seen in other societies up to this point, where it was understood as this kind of uh, circulation of life, um, this you know, movement of an animating force through the cosmos. Here what we're seeing is sacrifice that is harnessed in the service of state power here, associated with these two leaders. And this is... Um, very, you know, this kind of gets to the heart of the conflict between um, how, between our traditional image of Native Americans living peacefully, uh, you know, in harmony with the forest and with the animals, using all parts of the buffalo and so on. Because um, here we're face to face with something totally different, something that looks more like um, power as we see it in other ancient civilizations. You know, so this isn't necessarily to um, the discredit or to the credit of Cahokians to take part in these things like this. Um, but what it just tells us is that Native Americans' uh, history involves many of the same kinds of things that we see in other ancient civilizations in the world. We see power and we see violence um, in the service of the state, too. 
Yeah, so uh, the, some of these uh, other human sacrifices came to light <coughs> as early as the 1800s. So I you know, came across this great, overly dramatic newspaper article here, too. Uh, okay. So, uh, you know, let's move on a little bit to Cahokia religion um, and see what we can get um, out of the kinds of beliefs uh, that were behind leadership and so on, like we saw with Mound 72. Uh, so archaeologists can identify um, at least three strands of belief uh, in, in the Cahokian religious system um, based on later Native American mythologies and based on iconography from Cahokian artwork. So one of these is a whole trait of beliefs that probably were linked to masculine characters and masculine identities. Uh, these are all identified by links to birds, uh, specifically to falcons. So this is what we saw with the two leaders before. So in artwork, uh, people that are associated with this set of supernatural qualities uh, are identified by things like beak-type beak noses um, with this kind of forked motif on their eyes, uh, which um, is uh, what falcons have you know, on their eyes in North America. Um, Characters often have wings, too. So we see these uh, complex of traits. Uh, and it was also associated with um, chunky playing. So this guy here is holding a chunky, chunky um, stone. Uh, and with warfare, too. So this is a whole kind of militaristic complex uh, associated with Cahokia. And much of the imagery, uh, uh, ritual religious imagery from sites outside of Cahokia that interacted with Cahokia, um, reveals elements of this kind of masculine birdman complex. A different sort of belief is attested outside of the, the city center of Cahokia, and these center on female deities uh, and their links to agriculture, to the growth of plants, fertility, um, uh, serpents, too. The serpent appears often. Uh, so you see a different kind of constellation of traits. Notably, uh, none, of these, uh, f none of these feminine deities uh, have been uh, found in representations from the Cahokia downtown center. So we see a real geographical difference uh, in where these different cults were pursued. Then another strand of belief uh, is very uh, easily linked to uh, contemporary and historical Native American mythologies. And these revolve around a particular character uh, who later on was called Redhorn. Uh, so in you know, later depictions of this figure, he's identified by uh, this long red braid or other red uh, aspects of his body. Um, be, you know, things are colored red. Uh, he is also identified by uh, his earrings, which were human heads with a very long nose. Uh, mythology can get a little weird sometimes, so we don't know where this came from, but this is what he wore. Uh, so Redhorn um, not only was a character in later mythology, but... Uh, uh, in Cahokian art, uh, we can see representations of this character, too. Uh, so, for instance, there are, number, uh, there are at least two different sites of rock art uh, where he has been identified. See if you can make out this guy. Here's his head, and then here's this earring uh, with the little head with the really long nose on it. Uh, so this character, Redhorn, uh, was um, part of Cahokian beliefs, too. So he might have been kind of a deity uh, to them as well. Okay, so a lot of you guys have asked uh, in previous weeks about connections between North America and Mesoamerica, like the Maya and the Aztecs. Uh, so this comes into a bit of a discussion of uh, Cahokian beliefs, too. So this is a complex question to answer, and to make it short, uh, there does seem to be some evidence for interconnection, uh, particularly in the area of beliefs. Uh, so to get back to the guy Redhorn, uh, he was one of two twins, uh, and part of his uh, story, um, you know, the myth surrounding him is how um, he and his twin and then their supernatural animal friends uh, battled uh, other deities, uh, um, uh, particularly through warfare and through the playing of a chunky game. So this has a lot of similarities with uh, a myth recorded uh, by the Maya uh, in which two twins, uh, who are you know, hero twins, go to the underworld uh, and there they fight the, the lords of the underworld in a sacred ball game. So very notable parallels here. Uh, in terms of other beliefs, uh, the Cahokian, you know, we talked about the maize goddess. Um, so, you know, among the Cherokee later on, the goddess of corn uh, shared a very similar name with the Aztec goddess of corn. You know, 
Here's the Aztec goddess. So the Aztec goddess was uh, Silo Nen. Among the Cherokee, she was known as Silo. So very similar. It would be hard to explain this uh, similarity as a coincidence. Uh, and then there's other kinds of similarities, uh, for instance, uh, the number 52 and other particular numbers tend to crop up in both cultures. Uh, and uh, let's see what else. Oh, there's a, a goggle-eyed deity is what he's called with these big googly eyes here too. That guy appears in Mesoamerica too. So it seems like there is this kind of cross-fertilization of ideas at some point between Mesoamerica and North America, but it's a little more complicated because on the ground, uh, in terms of cold, hard data, there's actually very little evidence for interconnection. In fact, a little piece of obsidian like this from a site in Oklahoma is literally the only piece of, um, literally the only artifact that can physically be traced to Mexico during this time period. So it seems like what, what might have been going on was this interchange of ideas, um, but not so much of artifacts, not so much of trade. And what's important to recognize here is that this was uh, not just a one-way interaction. We have no idea that the Mesoamericans gave ideas to the U.S., um, or to the Cahokians in the U.S., uh, but it seems like there is um, probably more of a back and forth. You know, both groups were developing ideas at the same time. What we do know is that this would certainly have been possible um, because Cahokians, uh, like the Hopewell before them, like the people of Poverty Point, uh, were involved in extremely far-flung networks of trade and interaction, which extended across, uh, really across uh, the entire United States, you know, even to the Rocky Mountains here. Uh, and at many of the sites in the southeast uh, that had uh, mound and platform complexes that, you know, had these cultural traits of Cahokia. Uh, archaeologists have found objects uh, that we know literally came from Cahokia itself. So Cahokia was not just bringing in natural resources from other areas, things like you know, flint and copper and mica, um, but they were also producing uh, works of art that they then gifted to uh, these other um, political groups across the southeast, you know, kind of to reinforce their power and their cultural superiority, most likely. Uh, so two of the most prominent of these things uh, is this kind of pottery uh, with these uh, carved lines um, known as Ramian-sized pottery. Uh, and then another characteristic object are um, these figurines uh, known made out of a type of stone called flint clay. These were actually smoking pipes, um, so you can see where the, where the pipe went in the back here. So this would have been in some way ancestral to the famous peace pipe later on. Um, and these were actually very important in um, political and ritual ceremonies at this time. Uh, the tobacco, little known fact, the tobacco that Native Americans smoked at this time was actually extremely powerful. It had a huge amount of nicotine, more than the tobacco that we smoke today. Uh, so it would have had uh, almost a hallucinogenic edge, too. So it would have you know, changed the quality of interactions that people engaged in here, too. And these are always of men. You know, like I said, the masculine imagery is what's found outside Cahokia. Uh, so we see warriors, we see shamans, uh, and we see um, chunky players, too, depicted in these flint clay figurines. Okay, so you know, I talked. About, you know, at this point, I've talked about Cahokia, um, but I want to give you kind of a brief tour of some of the other sites that Cahokia was connected to. So we would call Cahokia itself. Um, you know, that's the only one that we would literally say Cahokian. Um, but the other sites are referred to as Mississippian. So, in other words, you know, connected to Cahokia, part of the same culture, uh, but each independent in their own right. So these were, you know all across eastern North America and definitely throughout the southeast where we are right now. So uh, I'm going to mention some of these sites because uh, a lot of them are not very far off the beaten path. So if you guys are traveling around, it's worth a visit to any of these. And I've actually um, listed them all on, the, on a document on the website in case you um, want to remember and check them out later on. One of these was Etowah, located in northwestern Georgia uh, between Chattanooga and Atlanta. Etowah was uh, another large city. Uh, around 1450, the site kind of came to a violent demise. Uh, there was a palisade wall built around this, uh, this, the site uh, that was burnt and never rebuilt at this point, and there was burning throughout the, um, throughout the site, too. In particular, these two guys, these stone sculptures, they're probably about this high. They're actually pretty big. Uh, these were found at the foot of the main pyramid here, kind of all, all askew. Uh, 
along with other debris. So they weren't really buried. They're just kind of laid down there. Uh, and what some have postulated is that uh, all this represents an attack by a hostile group uh, who came and who... Um, uh, violated, in, in essence, the shrine at the top of the platform mound uh, and who threw out forcibly the ancestral relics. So uh, the sacred male and female couple, you know, that um, have been the progenitors of, of perhaps the royal dynasty at Etowah and just thrown them air unceremoniously down the platform mound onto the ground here. Um, after this, you know, later on, there, there was some coalescence and there was another kind of twilight um, uh, twilight rain at Etowah that extended up through the 1500s. Uh, so when Hernando de Soto came through the southeast, he actually, you know, ran, fa ran uh, into these people face to face and spent some time at Etowah. And this is attested in a number of artifacts that have been found at the site that were clearly datable to the Spanish presence, like chainmail, uh, and I think a sword was found there too. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, and uh, you know, the, I just want to show you. Copper was often worked by Cahokian and related groups, too. So a number of these beautiful copper plates were found at Etowah. Um, and these two, again, you see this bird man with these wings um, and then these characteristic eye markings. Uh, Shiloh in Tennessee here uh, is better known for the Civil War battle that took place, but it was also the site of Native American mounds. Uh, a few mounds are located here. Again, we see one of these flint clay statuettes. Uh, the second biggest mound site after Cahokia was Moundville, located in Alabama, pretty close to Tuscaloosa. Uh, Moundville uh, consists of, I think, 29 platform mounds. So you can see from, the, from this aerial photograph, 29 platform mounds arranged around a plaza with this one much larger platform here, too. Uh, archaeologists working here have, uh, have um, um, confirmed that each of these smaller platform mounds uh, had a cluster of houses around it. Uh, and they think that these were probably the homes of extended kin groups or small communities uh, that each had their own platform mound probably to venerate their ancestors, to take part in their own you know, kin-based uh, ceremonies here too. I don't, I don't know how many miles away, but I think it's like, how many mounds? 29 mounds, yeah. Uh, around 1300, the site, um, seems to have been kind of abandoned, the population moves out, uh, and instead it took, o took on a character as a ceremonial site, uh, and people still came here to, the, to bury their dead in these, uh, you know, uh, kin-based um, platform areas too. So it kind of became um, a memorial cemetery, cemetery, as it were. It's near Tuscaloosa. Yeah. Uh, in Wisconsin, way further north, uh, even up there we have uh, remains of people p taking part in Cahokian culture. Uh, the site of Aztalan here has a number of mounds. It was surrounded by a palisade wall. Uh, and one of the questions that archaeologists have asked is whether these sites that have Cahokian attributes were made by people who, by local people who were just imitating Cahokia, or whether they were actually founded by people that came from Cahokia, kind of like, you know, missionaries of their culture or political representatives, we might say. Um, so Aztalan has been especially debated in these terms. Uh, and some analysis of the, the skeletons found here uh, reveal that they came from an outside area, that they weren't local. So some have um, speculated that they might have come from Cahokia. But you know, this, this awaits further investigation. Um, I should point out, too, in talking about all this trade um, and movement across North America, um, we know this because um, Human bones uh, tend to uh, reflect the chemical signatures of um, the local area where they drank the water. You know, where, where children grew up, drinking water has a certain chemical signature. So this gets solidified in bones. So we can determine where people grew up based on their bones alone. And same thing for artifacts, too. Um, when we look at things like clay or stone, um, when you look at the chemical composition of these raw materials, uh, uh, geologists can trace it to particular outcrops uh, of natural resources. Uh, so a lot of understanding of this movement of people and objects uh, has been achieved um, based, based on the development of these techniques in recent decades. Okay, uh, one of the later sites uh, is in Oklahoma. It's known as Spiro. 
Uh, Spiro was kind of like Moundville, uh, where it was occupied densely, and then at one point it was sort of evacuated, uh, and then just used for burial purposes. Um, and Spiro is notable because it was the site of this very distinctive burial, unlike any other um, that has been yet found. Uh, in one of the mounds, uh, there was a kind of a cavity hollowed out, and it was surrounded by logs to prop it up. And then it was just uh, stuffed chock full of beautiful artifacts, uh, many of which had been curated um, from Cahokia. So this burial took place around 1400 AD. Uh, so this is some hundred years uh, after Cahokia had kind of gone kaput. That it shows that people were still uh, looking back to Cahokia um, as an important place, as a source of power and authority, and using the objects from Cahokia as signs of that. So this is, um, you know, all these objects come from the site of Spiro. Um, actually, I should point out this, this statuette here represents that character Redhorn with his long, his long braid. And then he's, t you can't really see here, but he's wearing the human heads on his ears again. So another connection there. And then these are some of the other artifacts that came out of the Spiro find. Uh, again, these copper plates. Uh, and then you see all these ceremonial mace heads that the leaders would have... Um, would have wielded, so these kind of ceremonial axes. A lot of these sites, uh, research was done, uh, or very important research took place under the New Deal, um, so I should mention that kind of as part of an <coughs> American history intersecting with um, pre-Columbian history. Uh, so among the sites that um, people worked at were Spiro, Shiloh, Moundville, and Cahokia itself. Um, Cahokia was kind of the upper the upper limit that archaeologists could work at uh, year-round during the New Deal. Uh, above that, it was too cold. You know, I was thinking about that this morning, too. I wouldn't want to be working here in the winter, either. Um, so for, at all these sites, there were Works Progress Administration, <coughs> also Civilian Conservation Corps excavations. Uh, so really, uh, you know, a, a good hunk of what we know about um, um, the pre-Columbian uh, pre -Columbian history in North America came out of these New Deal programs. So they were very beneficial. Okay, the last site I want to take us to here uh, is uh, the site of Mound Bottom. And uh, I have to admit, I promised you at the beginning of the course that we'd try to do a field trip to Mound Bottom because it's just located just west of here. Um, that's not going to, that's not happening. Um, but I do want to let you know that I put up the information on the website in case anyone wants to visit Mound Bottom themselves. Um, so you need to get in touch with the ranger at Harpeth. Uh, Harpeth River State Park. Um, this is all written down, so you don't have to write this down right now. Uh, so you'll just need to contact a ranger, but just so you know, the, the tours end March 15th, so you got to hurry, um, and then they won't open again until October. But it's a great site. Um, so, it, you know, it would have been another one of these Mississippian sites uh, related to Cahokia. Uh, it was occupied between 950 and 1300 AD, so right around the same time period. And it's located on this, this wild bend, this horseshoe bend in the Harpeth River, you know, accessed only from this very restricted area. And from this aerial view, you can see, you know, a large mound, and then I think there's 13 other mounds around a plaza again. So if you kind of go around this road, and then up here is a series of bluffs, um, so this is the view from the bluff, and here you can see the site itself. So uh, if you go visit, the ranger should tell you how to get to the bluff. This is the site again in the winter. You can see the mounds clearly. Um, so on top of this bluff is a very cool petroglyph uh, that represents <coughs> one of the ceremonial axes that uh, Mississippian leaders used at this time. So uh, you know, if anyone likes to like just a moderately strenuous, it's not very strenuous hike, um, or just wants to go see the site, um, highly recommended. It. Uh, it's located in Cheatham County near, near Pegram, Kingston Springs, out that way. So that's Mound Bottom. So it's kind of our local mounds. Um, but then there are actually a number of other uh, Mississippian period mounds in Middle, middle Tennessee. Uh, most of them have um, been built over at this point um, by the early growth of Nashville. Okay, so what happened to Cahokia, and what happened to all these people? Uh, so Cahokia's collapse, like uh, the many other civilizations we've talked about so far, was, you know, to reiterate, it was very complex. Um, 
part of what was going on here was that uh, Cahokia, you know, as I said, as I was trying to stress, it was really unlike anything that had come before it. It was this new urban phenomenon. It also involved a much greater degree of social inequality. Um, There's violence and warfare as part of its, its growth, too. Um, different social classes. So it had these uh, internal tension to the society that, <coughs> that ultimately seemed to not have been sustainable in the long term. Uh, this may have been coupled with some environmental stress, like a number of droughts at this time period. Uh, there was even a very, uh, an extremely large earthquake that took place, uh, and it sort of caused part of uh, Monk's Mound to actually kind of sink and collapse. So this might have been kind of a reflection of the, the waning power of Cahokia leaders. At any rate, uh, by the 1300s, uh, uh, Cahokia had been abandoned, and uh, the people that lived there moved out just as they had all moved in there, you know, a few hundred years before. So the Cahokian experiment was over. Um, but uh, in, the, in many parts of North America and the southeast, uh, there continued to flourish a number of these smaller chiefdoms uh, that still had very powerful leaders, that still created beautiful works of art. Uh, and these were the people that your Spanish and other Europeans encountered when they first began to explore the southeastern U.S. Um, so, you know, here is DeSoto's trail going through this area. So he ran into a lot of different chiefs, uh, different chiefdoms on the route. <coughs> Cahokians themselves, the, you know, the people that literally lived at Cahokia, appear, uh, you know, as best we can tell, to have mainly moved to the north and the west, into the plains, actually. Uh, and uh, many uh, people have studied this, uh, identify a number of modern plains groups, uh, particularly those that speak Siouan languages, you know, like, like Sioux, uh, as the, the descendants of Cahokians. So this includes groups uh, uh, such as the Ho-Chunk, the Missouri, the Osage, and the Omaha that are um, out in this area. And this is reflected in particular in their mythology. You know, so I've alluded to this up to this point. No, they share many of the, the same figures that we see in Cahokia iconography. And uh, it's important to recognize, too, that, you know, when they moved into the plains fleeing Cahokia, there were already people there, too. You know, the whole area was populated. So this, you know, caused new fluctuations in, in population dynamics and in, in, um, uh, in, in conflict, too. There seemed to have been some increased levels of conflict among groups on the plain at this time period. Um, so, you know, we don't think about archaeology much when we think of areas like this. Um, but, you know, even the plains have been excavated, too. Uh, so, uh, in short, there were uh, Cahokian diasporas throughout North America, and the Cahokian influence lived on after this. So, uh, to kind of start wrapping up, uh, hopefully the upshot of all this is that Native Americans uh, were not timeless people, you know. They weren't just the noble savage, you know, living in perennial um, um, uh, communion with their natural environment, uh, but they experienced long histories of change, uh, just like people throughout the world did. You know, so in looking at Cahokia and other histories, we see migration, we see long-distance interaction, uh, we see political formations that rose and then fell, different kinds of political organization. We see the development of different religious systems. So there are all these major changes that took place. And uh, I want to kind of wrap up uh, on a, a cautionary note um, to all of us Americans who live in this area. Um, so much of the research uh, that has been done on uh, Cahokia um, and all these other sites uh, has taken place uh, in the form of what's called salvage archaeology. So archaeology that takes place uh, right in front of the bulldozer, basically. Uh, so. Uh, you know, there are federal le uh, there's federal legislation in place uh, that on public lands, when building projects take place and builders encounter uh, um, human remains or archaeological remains, uh, they need to call in teams of contract archaeologists uh, who will, you know, excavate and determine if the site is worth saving or not, uh, or if it's worth investigating. So in the majority of cases uh, of, of sites that are found uh, during these projects, Archaeologists will be called in and carry out a certain amount of excavation and then, um, you know, write up their reports and the site will be built over anyway. So this would be typical because there are a lot of, um, you know, economic interests at stake here too. So, you know, you wouldn't want to hold up the growth of, you know, Nashville just based on 
sites because they're really everywhere. They're all over the place. Uh, but it is, you know, it's a great loss uh, to archaeology because these sites are buried and we can't go back to them with the development of future research methods. You know, we won't be able to go back and figure out new, new data from them. But this is the way things are. And uh, in, in Cahokia, uh, actually, much of very large amounts of what we know uh, was founded uh, through salvage archaeology uh, that, that took place during um, highway development projects in the, in the later 20th century here. So Sulphur Dell, um, just, you know, just lately, would be one example of salvage archaeology. Um, this is the site of the new sound stadium being built um, between the capital and um, Germantown here. And Sulphur Dell, uh, when the builders got in there, um, they were turning up artifacts, and it turns out that this was a salt production facility um, used by <coughs> Mississippian groups here. Um, so this was not... Um, substantial enough to hold up um, the construction of the sound stadium, and um, this is now buried underneath the stadium. So it's a difficult balance, uh, obviously, you know, between you know, improving our, our urban environments, um, between growth of cities, uh, but also preserving the past. Um, but it's important um, to recognize that it's there. Um, because I think part of the problem uh, is that, you know, when we don't even, when we're not even aware of um, the history of Native Americans, you know, when we just kind of think of them as these simple people and don't recognize that they have their own heritage and their own archaeology, um, then how are we ever going to, how is the public ever going to care enough to try to think seriously about what's, what is worth saving and what is worth preserving? So this is something to take away. Uh, and to, to, just on, on the last note, a uh, little bit of trivia. Did you know we have a state artifact? Uh, this is a, a sculpture. I think he's about this high, too, made of sandstone. And his name is Sandy. So that's Sandy, the state artifact. <laughs> OK. So questions, then? I, yes, back there. Yeah, that definitely could have been involved. Um, you know, probably drought alone wouldn't cause a civilization to collapse unless there was already some, unless there were no um, ways for that society to address it, you know, and deal with it. Um, so probably would be dependent on other problems going on. But yeah, that definitely could have been a part of Cahokia's collapse too. Yeah, um, sir, back in the corner. Yeah, th thanks. Yeah, Moundville, like you said, Moundville has a, it's like there's a campsite too there, so it's, it's a great place to visit. It has a great museum too. Oh, uh, well, it was, it was not so much a question as a comment on the, um, the movement of Ch Choctaw people out of. Thank you. Yeah, ma'am. Oh, it's the, the Osher website, the Ali website. Um, yeah, I have a document. It has, so I list all of the, the different, all the sites that I mentioned today. I, meant, you know, I write down the name and where they're located. Uh, and then I also have the information for visiting Mound Bottom. Yeah. Um, yeah, ma'am.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, her question is, um, did something major happen in 1300 that caused civilizations in this area and also in the southwest to, to be dismantled, to collapse? Um, well, like I said, there were some droughts um, going on, uh, so it might have been related to that. Uh, I think... There's, there's, there's also like, you know, I don't want to say like major global warming, but like minor cycles of warmer and colder cycles throughout, throughout the hemisphere. Um, so that might have been one of the dates um, at which that happened. I can't actually recall offhand. Um, yeah, so drought might have been related to that. I don't think there's really been any big, you know, archaeologists have pointed out the, the co-occurrence of these changes in the Southwest and the Midwest, um, but uh, I don't think there's kind of been any consensus reached on that point yet. Yeah, right next. What was the era of the oh. stone box You know, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if that was just a localized Nashville thing or if that was more pervasive. I, I don't think that was a common practice throughout the Mississippian world. So I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Yeah, right behind. The mounds that are on Concord Road, are they from uh, a recent period? Or? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I... It's, it, I'm, I'm glad you guys are all pointing these, these sites out. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm just kind of, I just moved back to Nashville, so I'm kind of getting back into these local things. But yeah, I, I don't know when those ones are from. Oh, I don't know if they've been excavated yet. Um, some of this information you can kind of get online and do a little bit of research. Um, but really, there, there are sites all over Nashville. A lot of paleo, you know, sites going all the way back, you know, thousands of years, too. So it's really spanning a long period of time. Yeah, I think at the zoo, I think this, the, so they found human remains in, in expanding the zoo area, and I think it has just been established that those were from, um, that they were perhaps um, slaves, or from, definitely from the historic period, not, not pre-Columbian, is the last I've heard on that. Yeah, how about far over there? Yeah, okay, so the question is with, with the burials at Mound 72 in Cahokia, if these were buried with the rulers, like part of a, a, a bigger funeral of other people too, or if it was more of a religious rite later on. It's actually some of both, you know, so there's a lot, there, there's so many burials there. Uh, it's probably s some of the people were buried, you know, apparently at the same time in the same event as, as the rulers there, so they were, yeah, probably... Um, wives or relatives that you know went to the afterlife with the ruler, uh, but the other ones were definitely not relatives. They were, you know, clearly belonged to a different class. They came from a different place, uh, so they were part of. Uh,